Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says. Because it is impossible for God to lie. You know, potential is what might be, what could be, but it isn't yet. When it, a child is talented, a young person is talented, many times we will say things like, oh my, what potential. You know, but there's a big difference between what could be and what might be and what actually happens. And we know that this is determined by the decisions that we make in life. I mean, sometimes you'll see somebody that's not doing too well. And somebody will say, see that guy over there? Remember back in high school, college, wherever, when he was young, he was voted most likely, most likely to succeed. What happened? What happened to the person who was going to succeed, but they didn't succeed, or it appears that they didn't? Well, let me tell you something. Everyone in this room, everyone watching, has potential. God has given all of us the potential. We have been equipped through His Word with everything that we need to succeed in every area of life. And the world looks at it kind of like I illustrated earlier. They think that when you reach a certain age, you should attain the potential. And if you reach that age and you don't have success in the eyes of the world, that you haven't. But God doesn't measure things the same way that the world measures things. And your age and your gender and your race and your financial abilities in life, God, God doesn't measure things by that. God measures things by how much you submit to His Word and believe Him. See, believing Him is faith. That's, that's what faith is. Faith is simply believing God. And everyone in this room has the potential, no matter how old you are, or what you've been through, or what your past record is life, like, you, you have potential to be a success in the kingdom of God. So we ask ourselves this question, what is it that seems to hold us back from the success in the kingdom of God that we want to attain? What, what keeps us from being where we feel in our spirit that God wants us to be? What is it? Well, usually it's the attacks in life. I said it's the attacks in life. And the world is doing its best to shake us up. The world is, is trying to shake your tree. You know, Elvis Presley had a song back in the day. I'm sure all of you remember it. How many of you are older than 80? Okay, El Elvis Presley, you know, it's kind of interesting. I, I heard a guy say that uh, the other day that uh, his grandkids went to see a, a, a Rolling Stones concert. You know, Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones. And that they'd been doing this for five generations. It was a family tradition. That for five generations, they went to see the Rolling Stones. Okay. That was humor. <laughs> but it's true. How, how, how do you measure success? I mean, look at the Rolling Stones. I mean, old men in tights. I, um, I mean, my mother is 94. She turned 94 this week. And she looks like Mick Jagger's daughter. <laughs> yeah. I mean, those guys, they're good guys, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm not judging them in any way. 
But, you know, how do we measure success? Well, you know, there was, um, there was a day that I wanted to be like Mick Jagger. I remember when I thought Jimi Hendrix was the best dressed guy in America. Loretta dressed like Jackie Onassis at that particular time, but, uh, and we were quite the couple. Walking around, I had my bell bottoms and beads and, you know, hair, give me lots of hair, shoulder length and longer, hair, whatever, you know. My dad tried to kill me. <laughs> um, he's in heaven right now. He didn't succeed. Now, Loretta's brother was a bass player in my band. We had a band in Kansas City. Pretty good. My band in Kansas City, when we lived in Kansas City, we were hired to come down here and do the Camdenton prom. Can you believe it? But Loretta's brother was my bass player, and one day we were walking on Highway 50, and it was cold, and we'd been walking most of the night, and we had just finished playing somewhere, and, and I had my silk shirt on, you know, with big sleeves and flowers and bell bottoms and sandals walking on Highway 50, and my dad was coming up Highway 50, and he was in his Suburban, and I knew my dad was going to be coming that way, and we were cold, and I wanted to get a ride, and I hadn't seen my dad for six months, and I had what they call lamb chop sideburns at the time, and, uh, you know, and so we were on, my dad, my brother-in-law and I, which I'm going to see him tomorrow, but my brother-in-law and I, we were, it was so cold with the wind, we were hiding behind billboards up there in Sedalia. And so we, we decided, we knew my dad was going to be coming through, he was on his way to Kansas City, and we knew he would be coming through uh, Sedalia at a certain time. And so we decided we'd stay behind the billboards to stay warm. And then when we saw him, we would jump out and, you know, flag him down. Well, my dad hadn't seen me for six months, and it was a wild six months. And so I was under the, behind the first billboard, and about a hundred yards down the road, my brother-in-law was behind the other one, and uh, so my dad was coming in his Suburban. My dad's a good old boy. He wasn't too fond of hippies. And... Uh, so I leaped out into the road when I saw him coming and flagged him down, and instead of pulling over to pick me up, he tried to run me over. <laughs> I leaped back into the ditch to keep from dying. So we went back. i got to tell just a little more of the story. So I went to a gas station and called the highway patrol to have them stop my dad. And they stopped my dad in Warrensburg, and he came back and picked up me and Loretta's brother. And we went to Kansas City with my dad in the Suburban. And that was a long trip. <laughs> and let's just put it this way. At the end of the day, I did not have lamb chop sideburns. They, they somehow lost that day. And that was the day I grew up. Loretta's dad was waiting for us in Kansas City also. <laughs> Loretta's dad's in heaven, right? It's kind of nice having Loretta's dad and my dad both in heaven now. <sighs> They're waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Um, not everybody measures everything with the same measure. And I don't measure things with the same measure now that I measured them back then. You know, the things I thought were cool when I was a kid, I don't think they're cool anymore. I remember telling Loretta one day when we were in our 20s, uh, whatever the style of the day is, that's what I'm going to do. I am, I'm always going to keep up with the style of the day. Well, th when you see me walk in here in a tank top with no socks, tattoos, and a pig's nose ring thing, you know, Okay, lift up the word and repeat after me. We're going to start over. <laughs> oh, but see, here's the thing. 
uh, the word today was there's going to be a shaking coming on. And, and there will be a shaking coming on. And what they didn't know is basically the title of my message is Don't Get Shook. Don't get shook. There's, there's going to be a shaking coming on. But see, success hinges on the small things that you do in life. And you must not allow yourself to be moved by the enemy when these attacks come. 1 Thessalonians 3.1 says, Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that they, that we are appointed to this. Okay, now look, you know what God's called you to do. You know what you're appointed to do. And when there are afflictions that come, do not allow yourself to be shaken by them. Now, how can we do that? Well, there's always going to be tremors. And as we've said so many times, it rains on the just and the unjust. And don't think that just because you're a believer that attacks are not going to come against you. They are. They're going to be the same attacks that come against the people in the world. But the difference is, we have been equipped if we will Believe God, we have been equipped to withstand those attacks. It's kind of like condos built down in Florida. Some of them are built hurricane resistant. And some are not built up to the standards. They were built before the standards existed. When the hurricane comes, the ones that withstand are the ones that are prepared And they're built to withstand. Let me tell you something. You have been built to withstand. And when the bad news comes, and I'm not prophesying something, I'm just not saying anything different than the Word of God says. Bad news will come. If it hasn't, it will. But you have been equipped to stand and not be shaken by that bad news. And it all hinges on this. Do you believe God's Word? And that's the key. Believing God's Word is faith. You know, Jesus said in Luke 18, 8, He said, when the Son of Man comes back, is He going to find faith on the earth? In other words, He was saying, is He going to find people who believe Me? And if we believe Him, It doesn't matter how bad the report is. It can be the worst report you can even imagine. But if we believe Him, we can stand. Having done all, we will stand. The devil will shake your tree. Hebrews 12, 27. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things which are being shaken. Shaking will take place. As of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Hmm. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. See, look. The kingdom of God is where? He, the, the kingdom of God is in you. And that kingdom cannot be shaken unless you allow it. And the choice is yours. Last week we talked about first words. The way you respond to an attack determines how that attack is going to affect you. Huh. See, your friendships determine how you think. 
the people that you surround yourself with. Now, I, I apologize. I've got, I have one person who writes me about my English all the time. I ended that sentence with a preposition. And I know it. <laughs> Psalm 112.6 Surely he will never be shaken. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast. Why? Trusting in the Lord. If you can trust in Him and actually believe what He says, then when the storms of life come, you will not be like Elvis. You won't be all shook up. Once again, everyone over 80 laughed at that because they know who Elvis was. Some people shake at the slightest things. I've been with people who shake when the phone rings. Because it's almost as though they're expecting bad news. But the only reason you would shake would be because of fear and unbelief. The psalmist was not afraid. You know, if we go on further down to verse 8 where we were a while ago, Psalm 112 verse 8, his heart is established. He will not be afraid. His heart is established. He will not be afraid. If your heart is established, then your heart's going to be walking in perfect love. And perfect love casts out all fear. Wouldn't it be nice to just know that each day you're not going to be shaken? That no weapon formed against you can prosper? That no matter what the person says who calls you on the phone, it doesn't matter because your God is protecting you. His angels are surrounding you. The enemy can't get to you other than his voice. And that's the way the enemy attacks. Through words. Through fear. Hmm. But your heart must be established. Now, I'm going to touch on something here that is probably not politically correct. But I don't care. According to statistics, and you can look this up once again, you can look this up on the internet, and we all know everything on the internet is true, right? Not really. 20% of the people who smoke smoke secretly because they don't want anyone to know that they smoke. And of those people, almost 100% of them in a survey respond that they know that smoking is bad for you. That smoking causes all kinds of respiratory diseases. It causes cancer. And some, in some places, if you get cancer and you're a smoker, they won't even treat you. And these people, when they're asked if they're a smoker, they almost don't know how to answer. But here's the thing. A smoker is one who smokes. And it isn't how much or how little, or you're trying to quit. The question is simply, when you go to the doctor's office and it says, do you smoke? The answer is yes or no. It doesn't ask secretly, openly, how many times you've tried to quit. Now, that may be an illustration that bothers some people. And I wasn't going to say that today. But I really felt the Lord spoke to me this morning and said, there are people, literally thousands of people, who smoke, who don't want to smoke. Some, evidently 20% of them, are secret smokers, kind of like some people are secret drug users, whatever. And, and I'm a pastor, and I'm really smart. 
And I know this. Smoking can kill you. And I don't want you to die. God doesn't want you to die. God wants you to live out your full potential. God wants you to receive what He's promised for you. Look up Psalm 91. Long life. That's what He's promised you. Long life. Can we all agree on that? As a believer, you're promised long life. God wants you to have long life. But I believe the Lord spoke to me and said that if I would just mention that today, that there would be many, many people who would be equipped today to throw out the cigarettes. The, the today, you have, may have been trying to quit for decades. You may have quit ten times. There is no condemnation. Look, it, it's well known. Quitting smoking is more difficult than quitting heroin. People with severe drug addictions can quit their drug addiction easier than people can quit smoking. Both of them will kill you. You know, uh, one time it was revealed to me, and, and I really felt it was by the Lord, uh, smoking is just a very slow bullet. It's a, it is a form of suicide. And it's something that God... Look, your body, what's your body? Hey, John, what's your body? I know what your body is. Your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're a born-again believer. You're a deacon in this church. You love Jesus. And your body, according to the Scripture, is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Well, that temple should be filled with the Shekinah glory of God, not tobacco smoke. Yeah, and, and I'm just, if you're one of those 20% secret smokers, quit. <laughs> He's not. He's not. But look, so much in our life is determined by our decisions. And the things that tie us together and help us with our decisions are our friendships. It's our friendships. And your friendships, you know, the Bible talks about a threefold cord cannot easily be broken. Well, who's that third cord? That third cord could be the Holy Spirit. That third cord could be a demon. You know, uh, it's kind of interesting. I, uh, I ran across, I, as I'm thumbing through all these pages, you're going, oh my, he's got all those to go. No, I skip around. In my notes, I don't skip around. <laughs> um, but I ran across a, a verse. That I thought it was really interesting. Uh, remember when Pilate was judging Jesus. Now look, look what the Scripture says in Luke 23, 6. It says, when Pilate heard of, of Galilee, he asked if the man was a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at the time. Now let me tell you something. Pilate and Herod hated each other. They did not get along, okay? Look what it says in, in Luke 23, 11 going on. Then Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, Jesus, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. Look at verse 12. That very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other for previously they had been at enmity with each other what tied them together hatred it wasn't the holy spirit that tied them together it was hatred now you've got to guard what you hear you got to guard who you hang around with the advice that you get 
the advice. Okay, look. Let's, let's get back to something I didn't want to get to. If you're on heroin, don't hang around heroin addicts. Best thing I can say, if you're a smoker, hang around people who don't smoke. And they won't let you smoke in front of them. That'll help. Am I saying this out of condemnation? No. I'm saying it because I love you. And God is saying it because He loves you. He wants His best for you. God wants you to live out your full potential. The enemy wants to kill you. The enemy wants you to kill yourself. Mark 4.24 Then He said to them, Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. What you hear comes from who you associate with. And who you associate with will affect your decisions. And your decisions will affect your life. And even the little decisions. Now, you know, it may seem like a little decision, but when Loretta and I first got married, we made a decision that the D word was never going to enter into our conversations. I know there's a couple times Loretta probably thought about the M word, murder. But we never brought up the D word. And you have to make a decision sometimes. Okay, were there times, we've been married what? 40, 50 what? 57. It makes me feel good when she doesn't know. Okay. <laughs> but I think 57 years. Have there ever been times when she wanted to whatever? Yes, I can guarantee you. Probably back on that day when I had the lamb chop sideburns. She was probably, this good Christian girl was probably wondering, what did I get myself into? I mean, okay, moving right along. But you have to make a decision and stick with it. And that's what, making a decision and standing. You have to, you have to stand. You have to, you have to decide, I don't care what happens? I don't care what I hear. I don't care what somebody says. I don't care what the report is from the doctor. What I care is what God says. And in spite of everything that's going on, in spite of the hurricane, God has promised me that no weapon formed against me will prosper, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He promised me that. And I'm, I've got a choice to make. Am I going to believe God or am I going to believe the report? Now, you still have to, you can't ignore things in life. You know, and sometimes people, they'll get the wrong idea. They think when you stand on God's Word, you ignore things. No, there's, there's still decisions you have to make and things you have to do. But be led by the Holy Spirit. And the best way to do that is to pray in the Spirit every day and pray God's will for your life. Because when you pray in the Spirit, that's what you're doing, according to Romans 8, 26 and 27. Hmm. Okay. Ah, did you notice as I was turning those pages and getting rid of them, you heard the audience go, ah. Oh. <laughs> Well, let me, let me give you a, a good prophecy here. Jesus said, John 16, 33, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Shalom. In the world you will have tribulation. That word tribulation can be translated tests and trials. You will have them. 
Now, if you go over to John 16 and you read uh, John 17 and you read Jesus' prayer to the Father, he said, Father, they are not of the world, but they are in the world. And I ask that you don't take them from the world, even though they're not of it, leave them in it. And now he's telling us that in the world there will be tribulation. But then he goes on to say, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He's not going to overcome the world. He has overcome the world. And 1 John 5, 4 says, this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Our believing in Him. Hmm. Luke 17, 11, He said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses shall come. It is impossible that no offenses will come. What does that mean? We live in an offensive world. Right now, <laughs> I, have, I have never seen such an offended world. I mean, you almost have to have a playbook on what you can say and what you can't say. You know, Loretta and I were watching a, we were watching a TV series with Andy Griffith from the 1960s, and we're watching it, and we're going, oh my gosh, he would be thrown in jail for saying that stuff now. Our world has gotten to the point where you can't say what you think. Is it okay to say what you think? Well, it depends on what you're thinking. And there's, you know, you have to use common sense in your conversation. However, just understand this. We shouldn't be so touchy that you can't have a conversation with people. All right. God is good. So if, if His will is for your life and you pray His will, you need to understand this. Psalm 119.68 says, You are good and do good. Teach me. Teach me your ways. Oh, wow. Hmm. Okay. Well then, why don't we uh, drop down to the last piece of paper. See, it... Why is it when I say stuff like that, you guys, I can hear you all go, I can hear you. <laughs> you know, and you go, oh, and you smile. <laughs> Some of you have been asleep the whole time, but when I said that, it was like, you woke up, you know. You're thinking about that sandwich at Culver's, aren't you? Yeah, I think I am. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, Ephesians 6.13. You know, I, I was born in Climax Springs, Missouri. And I really wasn't brought up with a whole lot of learning and English speaking. For years, it has been so difficult for me to say the word Ephesians. You really don't care, do you? <laughs> Ephesians 6.13 Therefore take up the whole armor of God. Maybe we should just all read this together. Let's do that. Alright? Okay. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now verse 14. We'll put that up. Verse 14, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Verse 15, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. 16, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. 
Isn't that good? Amen. Having done all, stand. Having done all what? Stand. stand. Having done all, stand. Okay, what is the all that we are to do? Believe Him. Yeah. Our shield of faith. The shield of faith will quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. How many of the fiery darts will it quench? Okay. They're fiery darts. They will hurt if they get you. But your shield of faith is believing God. If you believe God, it doesn't say that the fiery darts will quit coming. It says that the shield of faith will quench all the fiery darts. So you, you just hold up your shield of faith and listen to as those darts hit the shield, you know. It doesn't affect you, right? Having done all, stand. Believe God. And let your belief in God quench all the fiery darts. And when you stand, you're not standing shaking in your boots. You are not to be shaken. Do not be shaken by these trials that come. But you can stand behind the shield with a smile on your face and think of some of Pastor Larry's funny stories. With the joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Isn't that good? Right, Michaela? Okay. See, even Michaela agrees with me. Well, having done all, let's stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory. We give you the praise. And we take your word as truth. Not just that it's true, it's truth. And we will commit to consider it all joy when we encounter various trials. Knowing that we're going to pass the test because we believe your word. And your word, the shield of faith, we can stand there and all the fiery darts will just be extinguished. Thank you, Father. Bless these, your people, in the name of Jesus. Amen.